Well, hello, Aru. Well, who, Hi, who, Peter. Hi, is this Tim? It is indeed, Peter. I'm so excited to be talking with you on Dave's show. Yes, yes, and I thank Dave always for, for letting me have the mic here because I just love the shape of a microphone, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm afraid I do. Now, you've written a book about something that I do not have and, and actually do not really, well, I want some of my own, but you've written a book called Savage Breast. And I, I just want you to tell all our listeners about this interesting book about the feminine side. That's right. This is about the feminine side of the divine. And, Peter, one of the things that is so weird about our culture here in North America is we've lost sight of the feminine nature of the divinity. You've probably noticed that God is spoken of as a father, sometimes as a son, but he's always this sort of uber-masculine divinity. And I started to wonder, well, what, you know, was this always the case? Did things used to be different? And I discovered that in the past, people used to worship the goddess just as much as the god, and they could worship the feminine divine and uh, uh, just, you know, let loose with that. And I'm wondering, you know, if that's something that resonates with your own experience. Well, I worship the feminine divine in every John Waters movie he was in, if you know yeah. what I'm saying. But, yeah, well, I worship the feminine, of course, but the feminine in men. But as far as this whole divinity kind of thing, what makes you think God was a feminine kind of personage rather than just God. Well, you know, the thing is, God, whoever he or she is, is what they are. But we as humans, we have to look at things metaphorically. So we somehow make the divine into our own image. And in the past, people made them in the image of woman just as much as they make God in the image of man. So if you go back even to the ancient Greeks, they saw the goddess of love in Aphrodite and the goddess of wisdom in Athena and uh, the terrifying aspects of the feminine in Hecate. And, in fact, both men and women worship the feminine divine. Sometimes, I should tell you, sometimes to real excess, you know, there was a, uh, a whole brand of goddess worshippers in Anatolia, in Turkey, who were so enamored of the feminine divine mm -hmm. that the men would actually castrate themselves to make themselves more like the goddess. Oh, my... Worshipper in feminine form. Oh, heavens! No, they would do this? Oh, my God! They, they would. In fact, there were festivals to Cibele, uh even in Rome. She, the, the particular goddess was so popular. And in these festivals, you would have men castrating themselves and throwing their organs into a huge and bloody heap in honor of this goddess. Now, to me, that's rather frightening and extreme. Well, I will, I will say, I remember back in 1964, um, when they had the Newport Castration Festival, <laughs> and Bob Dylan would not play there, and I was wondering why, and now I know. That was just, it was not a good festival at all. And just, just burning all the, uh, the garbage, I mean, it was bagging up at Woodstock when they left all that stuff behind, and, and all their garbage and, and the mud. But, oh, the Newport Castration Festival, how they cleaned that up, I will never, ever know. Yeah. All I know is that the barbecue they had, I didn't touch it, I didn't go near it, uh-uh, no way, sorry. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is these sorts of ancient festivals may well have been what led to the whole idea that priests need to be celibate. And that it looks like uh, the, the robes that priests wear now, nowadays are actually taken from the robes that goddess that the, the female priestesses to the goddess used to wear in ancient times. So castrating themselves and then becoming later on just plain celibate was one way that men managed to get into the spiritual hierarchies that used to be dominated by women. And, you know, let's face it, men have done a pretty good job at taking over organizations like the Catholic Church and other sort of mainstream churches today. Why did men feel that they had to do this? Why couldn't they share? Why couldn't they be half woman, half man? Kind of like, eh, you're through it. That is an absolutely great question. And not only that, but why can't men who are strongly hetero, well, i got to say, like myself, you know, why can't we also see something beautiful and erotic in the divine? Why is it that the only, the closest we have to a sacred feminine is, is Mary the Virgin Mother? I mean, I think that uh, the, the, the divine should be well, no, well, in the erotic form, too. You're leaving out Barbara Streisand. Okay, you know, well, this is it. I think that... Um, uh, you know, some men who are much more in touch with the feminine energy, they've got a far greater appreciation for the wonders of femininity. But man, we guys are sort of stuck in this macho John Wayne worshipping mode. You know, that's a, that's a real shame because uh, the female form is something to really be worshipped. Now, now, your book is not just a philosophical and an educational kind of discourse on going to all these different places in the world and, and 
learning about their goddesses and their female worship, but there was a personal side for it. When you talk about the whole macho thing, and, and you, oh, I, I heard you were very, very, even now, you're saying, well, a, a 100% hetero man like me, ooh, ooh, so you still have, you guys still have issues, little mister, you do. Yeah. <laughs> but you had even more issues back then. Well, I won't say that I think that everybody's got their issues, but we also all have our proclivities. And I've got to say, my, my proclivities tend to draw me towards the feminine as that which I'm attracted to rather than that which I identify with. But I've spoken with um, with a lot of gay men who um, really find that they can identify with the goddess in their own worship of the sacred feminine. But, you know, we uh, we hetero guys can also worship the goddess. That that, that, what what you mean by we, white man? <laughs> but I'm also talking about the whole personal story yeah. that you well, went through. The personal story for me is, you know, here I, I was really interested in the feminine divine, but I had to say that my own relationships with women really uh, were terrible. I'd been divorced by the time I was in my mid-30s. I had, like, about four major relationships with women. So it all ended in disaster. And when I started writing about the goddess, I realized that what was coming to the surface was, was my own deep misogyny and difficulties with really honestly accepting a woman into my life as a lover, that I kept wanting a woman but then pushing her away at the same time and all sorts of commitment issues. And coming to terms with the goddess, with the true divine feminine, helped me see that for what it was, helped me see that behind it was a lot of fear of being too close to the feminine. Well, well where did that come from? You know, I think that... Uh, mommy know, Dearest? Be honest. Sorry, from what? From Mommy Dearest? Yeah, I think that a lot of it comes not, not from, from our mothers, and, and also, in a sense, our mothers in a, uh, in a deeper than personal way, because each of us, you know, we took shape inside our mother's body and when we were little tiny things. There was this all-powerful feminine presence that took care of us. And I think when we grow older, we get really scared that if we fall back under the influence of that feminine presence, then it'll take us over. And, um, and a lot of men are afraid of that happening. And they trans translate that into their relationships with women. And in a sense, having recognizing the feminine as divine helps us have a relationship with that divine mother, which then means we don't have to bring that into our relationships with real flesh and blood women. And frankly, and for my own life, it's kind of a relief that I'm no longer imposing that. Well, that yeah. Well, you mentioned that um, in, in the introduction to the book, and I, I, I have read the introduction. I've done that. I'm so busy with my summer reading already that I'm afraid I haven't gotten through the whole book because I start seeing these long Greek names, and I start thinking about Greek statues and Greek men, and then I have to read a very different book. But, you know, but I, I did find something interesting that in these relationships that failed, that tanked, that crashed and burned, yes. you weren't like abusive or anything. If anything, you were trying to make the women happy. You were nice to them, or, or you, you thought you were being so, and yet that was just making you more pissed off and rage-filled. Is that, is that sort of a, a true thing? Yeah, that's right, and you know, I, I sort of was playing Mr. Nice Guy, but you know, my uh, um, you know, deep inside, the part was, that was getting resentful, that would come out and it would end up just sort of lashing out and, uh, and doing nasty things, you know, cheating on someone. Uh, or, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, the ways that men can easily destroy a relationship are, uh, are too numerous. Oh, please. I've had relationships destroyed between the first cocktail and four in the morning. Yeah. Please. <laughs> but how do you then make your current relationship? You're in love, right? You have a wife, you have a, a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend. Well, uh, a wife, yeah. wife, you have a wife. So how is this relationship so different and from your learning about the goddesses. Yeah, you know, I used to um, really, uh, I, it, it comes right down to two things. One is connection, and that is seeing that um, you can be connected with a woman, and that that takes being honest and truthful and not hiding away who you really are. And before, I think I really wanted a relationship with a woman, but didn't want them to really know me. And with my current, uh, the, the, the woman who's now my wife, man, she just really knows me. And, and you might think that's kind of scary, but when you can really trust the other person, man, it can be beautiful. So that's what I've managed to, to find with the woman who's, who's now my wife. And how long have you been married? We've been married for three years, but we've known each other for ten years. In fact, she came with me on many of the, of the adventures that Savage Breast is all about. 
And a lot of times I'd be trying to work stuff through with the goddess, and she would really become that goddess for me. She'd become Aphrodite, or she'd become Akate, the queen of the witches. Now, wait, well, now how would she do this? Was this like a role-play thing? Did this, did this thing involve handcuffs? <laughs> Not exactly, although there was one birthday one birthday where she surprised me by dressing up as a Minoan snake goddess, which was pretty extraordinary, I have to tell you. What, what does a Minoan snake goddess wear? There, she doesn't wear anything from the waist up, I can Wiggle! tell you. Wiggle! Wait, what am I getting excited about? I'm, I'm, I'm 100% <laughs> homo. I don't know, you might want to take a look at that there, Peter. There might be a little bit of the heterosexual lurking deep in your heart. Oh, oh, good, oh, no! Oh, ew! <laughs> during the commercial. Oh, no, it's okay to be erotically attracted to women. That's no, it's... That's kind of what worshipping the goddess is all about. Uh, no, I worship my own goddess. Ooh. <laughs> no, oh, now we have to go get commercial, but we will be right back with more with Tim Ward, author of Savage, you should pardon the expression, Brass. Hi, this is Tim Ward. I'm the author of Savage Breast, One Man's Search for the Goddess, and you're listening to me on Dave's Gone By at WGBBAM. Welcome back, Aru, to Dave's Gone By. I'm Peter Fitzgerald, and I'm the head of Wiggle Far, the Woodmere Gay Liberation Front and Rear, and I am talking to Tim Ward, who is the author of Savage Breast, One Man's Search for the Goddess, which is how he went from being a real macho kind of man who just didn't appreciate women, even though he thought he did, to learning about the goddess and all of us and how powerful and wonderful the feminine is in our world. For example, this, this is the quote from one of the reviewers. An epic, elegant, scholarly search for the goddess. It weaves together travel, Greek mythology, and personal autobiographic relationships into a remarkable exploration of the Western world's culture and sexual history. It is also entertaining the human as we listen and learn from this accomplished person and the challenging mate he wooed. Now, that was from Harold Schulman, who is professor of gynecology at Winthrop University Hospital. And you know what book he wrote, ladies and gentlemen? Harold Schulman is the author of An Intimate History of the Vagina. Now, I've never read that one. But uh, hopefully I'll be able to experience it for myself when I have that surgery. Helen Node, author of The Ticket Out, called Savage Breast, ballsy, entertaining, adventuresome, wild, scholarly, sexy, and deep. Ooh, ooh, wiggle, wiggle. So, Tim Ward, welcome back. We're talking more to you on Dave's Gone By. So we were hearing about all your personal history and discovering the goddesses for yourself. What are the, some, some of the stories that you came across while researching all these different goddesses from history? Here's one of my favorite ones, Peter. This concerns the goddess Aphrodite, the sexy goddess of love. Oh. And she uh, once fell in love with a mortal man. And she came to this man, his name was Anitrasis, and uh, when he, as soon as he saw her, he recognized who she was, and he begged her, Oh, please, Aphrodite, he said, please go away from me. Don't seduce me. Ooh. And she said, why? And he said, well, I know that if a mortal man makes love with an immortal goddess, he'll never again be able to have sex with a mortal woman. Oh. And there's something here to me really worth thinking, and that is that, you know, how typical of a man that he would rather night with Aphrodite, the goddess of love herself, would rather give that up if it means he couldn't you know, screw everyday run-of-the-mill mortal women after. Now, doesn't that say more about men's preference for quantity over quality <laughs> than really any woman would want to know? Well, let, let me ask you something. Yeah. Because we, we, we've been broaching this whole monogamy issue. You as, yeah. a, as a hetero man and me as a homo man. Yeah. And all this guy stuff. And now you're, you know, you're not cheating on your wife. You've been married three years. You've been with the same woman for ten. Is the monogamy part somehow part of appreciating the goddess? Or can goddesses say, hey, wait a minute, let's all have sex with everybody because it can be fun, especially if you're in the right nightclub. Well, I think that sex is a gift of the goddess. And, and one of the ways that you can worship her is through sex. And I think that the goddess doesn't have a moral requirement like, you know, good old Jehovah, that you limit your sexuality for the sake of morality. In other words, sex is not a sin. 
sex is a gift, and it's to be enjoyed. You say it, boy! Ooh! Go, brother! Absolutely. Amen. That is my religion. Wiggle! Now, <laughs> now, in truth, when you find a person who you know deeply, intimately, there is so much joy in just sharing your depths with that one person. And frankly, okay, I'm now a man in my mid-40s, and I don't have anything I want to spare for anybody else. I need to save it all for the woman I really, truly love. And I am so happy with that. But I don't think that the goddess has, you know, has set out a rule that people ought to be one way or the other way. But what I do think is that sex is something that is deeply spiritual. It's something that can go right to your very depths and make you, you know, make your soul shudder. And that's something that really needs to be honored and not wasted. And a lot of times, especially in North America, uh, we tend to have sex like we have a bag of Doritos. And... I want that bag, let me tell you. Yeah. But, you know, it must be the extra spicy nacho. Yeah. <laughs> right. The question is, can you have it in such a way that it's a beautiful thing and that, that your life is richer, deeper, more beautiful because you've got that in it? And, um, you know, that's, that, that's something that, that we each get to, uh, to play with on our, on our own terms. I'm just so happy that the terms that I have involve really doing it with this woman I love you know, right to the, right down to my toes. Oh, that's, that's the week I could almost throw up. No, no, I, I can't. <laughs> well, Peter, you know, the, the, the one of the things that, that I found most difficult to get about the goddess is that the goddess, particularly Aphrodite, the erotic goddess, Ooh, yes. she's the one who made men. She made a lot of men, if you, if you know what I'm saying. She made men because one of her nicknames was Philomenides, which means the uh, means fond of a man's genitals, but it also means owner of a man's genitals. Owner of a man's owner of a man's owner genitals. Of, oh, and if you sorry. look at Aphrodite, you often see her worshipped in the form of a uh, column or a uh, phallic meteorite, and she's you know connected so much to phalluses. I wondered why is that, and the truth of the matter is, oh. Aphrodite created sex. Why? Because sex is the way you mix up DNA and you get stronger, more diverse organisms as a result. If you didn't need to mix DNA, if you only had a single gender that budded or cloned itself, yeah. you could do that, and that one gender would be women. So why did so when Aphrodite created two genders in order to make sex, the gender she created with the extra gender was man. Wow. So I thought the extra gender was Beatrice Arthur. You know what that means? That means we were created for one purpose, and what's that purpose? To have sex. Okay, now Aphrodite would say to have sex with women, but hey, there's enough of us that we can have sex with men if that's the way we're made. That's the way I'm made. Absolutely so. You know, but, you know, the fact of the matter is the male gender exists because of sex. Oh, I like that explanation. Let, let me ask you before before you have to leave us, Tim. Yeah. This whole big thing now, because there's a movie coming out in a big, important book called The Da Vinci Code. Now, yeah. I haven't read the book. I don't even like Leonardo Da Vinci's paintings very much. But what what does that have to do with anything? And, and yet you're trying to tie all this in with your book, The, the Savage Breast, in with The Da Vinci Code. What, 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 what will you tell us? The whole story about The Da Vinci Code is tracing this bloodline, supposedly, of Mary Magdalene and Jesus who had a baby. Uh, but this was all covered up with the church because the church wanted to cut the sacred feminine out of Christianity and out of the religions that preceded Christianity. So they made Jesus a celibate guy who didn't have sex with anybody. And they made the religion one of Jesus and his twelve apostles a male-only thing. They cut the sacred feminine right out of the religion. But if you look beyond that to where my book looks, you can see that the goddess permeated all of life. And the story of the Da Vinci Code is hearkening back to those ancient goddess religions. The main character, this, this uh, art historian who's trying to solve all this mystery, he's written a book in the novel on goddess symbols in the early church. Oh. So the goddess is right at the root of all of this. And I think the reason this book has be really caught on and become so such a fascinating story for people is because it does tie us back to the sacred feminine and what... Uh, this earlier religion gave us that modern religion with its focus on the Father and the Son does not. I should tell you one more thing about sure. Leonardo that you, Peter, really ought Ooh. to know and be interested in. Tell me. And that is that Leonardo, quite possibly, was, if not by, was 
was quite likely gay. I knew it! I knew it! Oh, wiggle! I've got to, I've got to reevaluate all his paintings You'd now. You better go back and look at all those paintings again. Every picture of a banana, I'm going to look real he, close. He, you know what I'm saying? Beautiful, beautiful drawings of John the Baptist. Hmm. Circumcised or un? I don't I don't recall. I that. don't think that Leonardo's paintings went into quite that detail with John the Baptist, but he'd probably be circumcised if you needed to know the truth. He was Jewish after all. Yes, that's, that's, that's true. Nice Jewish boy. Well, not so nice Jewish boy. Oh, well. I wouldn't date him. I have higher standards, if you know what I'm saying. By the way, yes. this being Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day to, to... Do you have kids? I do, Peter. I've got a son. Oh, by your current, um, shall we say, in a very loving and blessed way, ho? <laughs> by my by my sainted and beloved ex-wife with whom I had a terrible relationship, and out of that terrible relationship came this most wonderful boy. Oh, well, well happy Mother's Day to that mother, of course. How is your relationship now with the mother that you obviously had so much rage and hatred against? Did, did you do your jail time? Yeah. <laughs> it's really great, you know, and I think that being able to work through all the issues that I've had with women has actually helped me be much more relaxed with uh, with my own mom. Um, and, you know, I, I'm at a point now, she, she must be, uh, she's in her early 70s now, and I just, uh, just really love and adore her so much and it's great to you know spend you know time with her two or three or four times a year and uh, uh, I, I just uh, I just think that yeah. so many men end up having to sort of feel this sort of strange worship towards their mother which means they don't ever really get to the point where they can experience the rage and hatred towards mom which needs to come to the surface for them to be free of it and clean of it. Oh, well, I can't be with my mother for more than three minutes without the rage exploding. Please. Oh, well, you know, I'll bet you're right. All over Florida. And I'll bet you there's so many men for whom that's, that's the same thing, but it's so taboo to say something bad uh, against your mom. But uh, the, the men end up really trapped. And, and I think that one of the wonderful things about seeing the feminine face of the divine is she can take all that rage. The divine can handle our true feelings, and when we can express them towards the divine, then our actual relationships with real women, whether our mothers or our lovers or our daughters or women at work, it gets cleaner and more relaxed. And we can see them as real people, not as iconic goddesses that we have these these old emotions towards. So, so I think what you're saying, Tim Ward, is, is that we should be able to go to our mothers and our wives and our girlfriends and grandmothers and all that and say, you awful, hateful bitches! Oh, oh, shame on you, how you've ruined us, how you've made us, and this this will be healthy. No, Peter. That oh, would be I've, I've missed the boat again. <laughs> but what I do think is I think we should look at the faces of the feminine divine that our ancestors have left us, and we should feel the emotions that are buried in us there, and bring them to the surface and realize that often the anger we bear towards women isn't towards this or that particular woman, woman but is towards the fact that we have been cut off from the love of the goddess, the, the need for the feminine has been denied to us for so many years, and that when we recover that on the spiritual plane, we find there's much less trauma in our actual relationships with real women. And those real women, they don't exist to torment us or to give us pleasure. They're just people we share the planet with, and we should just love them as human beings, not as, as uh, spiritual figures in disguise. Well, this is Tim Ward talking about the feminine, the divine goddess, and what we should be allowing back into our world, our, our social world, world, our spiritual world. It shouldn't be all men, alas. We need to allow the feminine in. And if you want to read more about this, please, please get a copy of Tim Ward's book, Savage Breast. Now, where can they get this, Tim? Peter, it's in bookstores everywhere right now. You can also, of course, get it on uh, online at Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. Um, so pretty much any bookstore. And, you know, particularly for any of your uh, listeners out there, Peter, who are who are uh, women who think, man, I wish, you know, I could get, you know, the man in my life to, to, to deal with these issues of women and, and, and commitment and this, this rage that so many men have. I'd say, women, please go do your man a favor. Buy him a copy of this book from other states. Or, or Father's Day. It's a perfect Father's Day gift. And Peter, you know, I would just like to finally say for you, I hope that this Mother's Day you go to that sweet woman who gave birth to you and you just tell her how much you love her. Well, 
I'll even put some flowers on her grave. I will. Do, no, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I, I bought. She's still alive, but I bought the grave a couple of years ago, just in the hopes that soon. But she just hangs on. My issues, I'll deal with them. But Tim, you've been wonderful. You've been, you've been adorable. I thank you so much for talking about your book. I wish you best. Are you working on another book? I am, dear. I'm working on a book about the goddess Athena right now, and how uh, men and women in the workplace can uh, can really learn from her. Well, best of luck on that, and all your travels, and with your family, and everything. Thank you so much for you're being welcome, Peter. Oh, Peter, if you've got a second, do you mind if I tell your listeners my website in case they want to visit me? God, you're endless. I've, I've tried to end this twice already. Well, go ahead. It is www.savagebreastbook.com. Huh. Yes. www.savagebreastbook.com. That's right. Anything else? Are you, are you pushing any rodeo tillers or anything? A, a wonderful Mother's Day. Pick some flowers. Give them to the woman you love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. You've been great. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.